Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Karel Ulner. Karel is a billboard sharding, electronic dance music producer and DJ. Karel, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Spencer. Awesome to be here. Awesome to have you, buddy. Welcome back. Thank you. It's uh, the third time, and it's uh, awesome to awesome to always come back and share what's new, what's going on in the industry. Really happy to talk about whatever you want to talk about, but happy to start start there if you like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I'd be curious, kind of hearing um, some of what you've been up to lately, and then also uh, you talked a little bit about questions you get asked by sort of young artists that are looking to get into it. Um, maybe that would be a fun sort of tangent to go off on is like mentorship advice you would give to those looking to get into music. Absolutely. So again, just to kind of recap, like my background has started out originally as wanting to play guitar and sing. That was what, all I really wanted to do when I was young in middle school. I started bands, whatever I could possibly do to play gigs. And then that led me down the road of just kind of keep, keep going down these rabbit holes, learning another thing, songwriting, producing, um, how to mix your own tracks, how to, you know, if a person doesn't show up to a recording session, I'm going to play the drums instead. <laughs> like, you know, so <laughs> I keep going down these rabbit holes. My mind kind of works in this way that like I'm just like like an astronomer trying to figure out what's the nature of the universe. I'm trying to figure out what's what's the whole picture here, what's really going on in the music industry to make something really successful, get that end product right. And uh, that kind of led me down these rabbit holes. Um, coincidentally, the EDM music stuff kicked off. It happened to it happened to uh, work at that time also where um, a lot of uh, internet collaboration was really starting to peak and, um, and turning into what it is today. Um, and I really... My aim originally was to build a label, and as hard as that is to do, we were definitely successful in getting billboard charting tracks, um, especially uh, back in uh, 2017 and 18, we got some U.S. billboard charting tracks um, in collaboration with a lot of uh, remixers, uh, remixing the song, and a lot of DJs playing the songs in the clubs. Um, that was our way that we happened to get there, myself and my sister, who was also a singer, part of our Corel and Exogeny project that kind of spearheaded um, that project. And then, of course, um, pandemic hit. Everyone was affected by this one way or another. For us, it meant that uh, we put the music for a little bit on the back burner. We started working with other artists. Turned out to be great. Started working with the developing uh, artist uh, 10 Steps, not really developing anymore. He's uh, been touring with uh, Andrew Rael, who's uh, you know, all signed to Armin Van Buren's label. Um, we contributed uh, several songs to him so far, some more to come. His artist album coming out actually on October 6th, um, just to keep an eye out for that. It's really awesome stuff. Um, and we've kind of kept going in the same vein, collaborating with more and more EDM producers. Um, especially and uh, seeing where we can kind of go from there. That's cool. In the process, in the process, it's really turned into um, really spearheading things, of course, trying to gain new opportunities through that project, but not only for us, but for others who are interested in writing songs with us or maybe it's their first writing credit um, on a label-signed track um, or a new producer um, looking to do a remix of our song. We're happy to send our song to anyone who wants to remix it. Um, but that's really driven me into this artist development lane, which is like half of what I do now. Um, so there's a lot of, you'd be, you would think that artists today would have a lot of questions about, well, how do I like hone in like that main craft that I do? If I'm a singer, how do I make that the best thing it can be? Surprisingly though, a lot of the questions that I've gotten in the last couple of years is always like, there's so much mystery around the industry and the business side of things. And nobody seems to, 
um, have concrete answers for how to scale a brand. Like, you know, how do you take your singing into some sort of chart topping career and then start a clothing brand like Rihanna and become a multi-billionaire? Like, nobody knows how to quite make this work. Um, and I believe that I've come up with a couple guidelines, not to, not that anything's ever a guarantee, but something that helps anybody from any stage kind of wrap their head around what's going on and how to really get their first steps into being involved and then thinking, well, okay, like now that I'm involved here, how do I grow from there? Um, and again, it's like, it's a completely different conversation with everyone. I'm happy to kind of dive deeper into that if you like. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, so I guess maybe just to take a step back and ask a question from the outside looking in, do you have to start with the goal that you want to get a big clothing brand or like, you know, is it a commercial endeavor? I'm sure passion plays a role since you're making art. And at some point that's got to come from what you're feeling. Um, to what extent, like how do you balance those? I, I, maybe I can sort of relate to my work too um, a little bit once you kind of state your thoughts on that. Absolutely. And, and again, the, while, while in the past, just to make the distinction, the record sales were the driving force. Now artists have, especially music makers have been forced to find other income streams while having a merch merchandise sales or whatever as an accessory to what you're originally doing um, was it was an accessory in the past now it's become more of a necessity it's literally it could make or break um, one of your expensive tour dates let's say a band coming through New York City is trying to like be able to pay you know pay their way through that city I mean someone coming in and buying 10% of the people buying some merch could honestly make that a big difference make it possible for them to come in um, it's uh, again the record sales have gone a little bit to the wayside. It's more about live shows, um, some some sort of a, um, uh, marketing endorsements um, or some sort of a collaboration marketing wise with other brands, and kind of into that. If you're able to sell another physical product that replaces the record sales of old, then that's able to um, continue to sustain you even while you're not on the road, while you're not. Um, doing that physical performance. That's really interesting. Um, um, not to cut you off, I, I just have a follow-on sure. question, which is, what percent of the uh, the cover sales does the uh, the musical act usually see in these venues? Uh, in your experience, and then just a follow-up to that is, you know, does the band see like a hundred percent of the merch, or like how does how does that breakdown work? Sure. So usually. From what I've seen, venues don't really dip into merchandise sales. It's It doesn't seem like a common thing that I've seen. Um, what is more common, though, is that um, especially venues um, in New York City, which really kind of set the bar, like a Brooklyn Mirage or something like that, they are able to sell an experience with or without that DJ there. Ah. So they're able to, they have extra leverage in being able to get a bigger cut from um, either an upfront fee or, you know, piece of the ticket sales um, because, you know, people just want to be a Brooklyn Mirage. And it, the fact that Zed or Tiesto is there is 50%. Oh, that's interesting. Um, perhaps. While in other, other venues, I mean, um, if, competition obviously is tough if you're then going to a competitor you and you're a big act you probably have a much better leverage going to a smaller venue that you're guaranteed to sell out you, you know maybe the venue takes 10 percent um you know just because obviously they got to get paid they got to pay their staff um that's typically what how i would think about that yeah. but now see if you're a brand new act you're constantly facing that um the challenge of well the venue is not going to take a chance on you as a headliner if you have never proven that you've sold out um, a venue of that size or, you know, you, you have to sh prove one way or another that you have that draw, whether it's your online um, um, interaction or uh, people that come and view your live streams. And I'll dive deeper into that, too. Like, that's maybe one way to prove how to get your first gig. Like, look, I got a thousand people every night coming to check me out. and They're located in New York City. Um, 
and if we do a live show, it's guaranteed to be a success at a 200-person venue. Um, that's probably something that you'd be looking to do. But now, the people that I'm working with are not even at that stage. That is like a negotiation that naturally happens once you've built some audience. I would not actually recommend post-COVID look do, to do a live show unless you have some sort of guarantee like that, because it doesn't make business sense. So the guarantee is being able to prove listenership at like a five to one ratio in the market you're going into and say, look, I mean, if even 20% of my fans in this market show up, you know, you're selling out. Exactly. Yeah. And then maybe another way to do it, a little bit talking about um, more about the interpersonal relationships with the artist. You could probably, um, if you have a great re relationship, um, you can probably get some good deals opening for an artist, maybe doing a shorter set. Um, as the first opener or like the the last closer, um, that might get you a little bit exposure. You might not be you're not that person who's at the top of the the bill, but like you're getting some exposure. That is more so a way that um, I recommend people get involved. And the similar mentality goes with uh, you know sending songs for collaboration. It's not always about you being like the main person getting everything your way, but collaboration really is the key. And if you collaborate with enough people, you're able to get um, your brand to a completely different level. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I would say, you know, that's probably true in engineering as well. <laughs> I mean, if you of course yeah, collaborate with bigger brands and, and they like your work and they see that you know what you're doing, you know, then more more business comes in. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I guess I was I was wondering from a merch perspective. So, I guess I was at an Eric Clapton show a couple of nights ago, and it was total impulse buy. I was I was out for dinner with a colleague, and excuse me, people will be able to date when we recorded this if they look up the tour dates in Pittsburgh. But you know, I um, he was like, "Do you want to see Eric Clapton?" I was like, "Yeah." And I went, and the tickets were like, I, I think we paid like 180 bucks, but it was on a secondary market, so maybe retail they were like 150. The guy sold out a stadium, so that had to have been most of it. Um, but then I, I think I bought like a $50 T-shirt as a gift for a friend on the way out of the door. Um, and so in my mind, like assuming that like, you know, the PPG Paints Arena is like the Brooklyn Mirage, and they've negotiated 50% of Eric Clapton's ticket sales with Eric and his band. Um, and I pay $150, say, retail, just speculating, even though we paid, didn't pay retail. Then, you know, Clapton gets, like, $75, like, paying the band aside. We'll just say it's one entity from that. And then, like, another 50 bucks off the T-shirt. I guess that's a decent amount more money. I mean, that's, like, you know, that's boosting, like, 40%, like, the money you're making. So... Or maybe do you happen to know? Do you happen to know how many people fit in that arena? Fuck PPG Paints, not offhand. I mean, it's it's a sports stadium. I think they play hockey in there most of the time to show my naivete with sports to the listeners. But I um, I can imagine like tens of thousands, like probably like you know, I don't know if I had to guess, like thirty thousand maybe. Cool. Uh, I mean, my guess like is that. Uh, and we were on the that floor, show. so I'm guessing the ancillary seats cost less and the front row cost more. Of course. And, and I would, I mean, I'll probably look at the average cost and kind of just go from there. I, you don't, I don't know for a fact what the numbers are, but I would guess, let's say, let's say it's, I don't know, 30,000 times uh, 50 bucks a ticket. That's, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that like Eric Clapton can probably get away with taking home a million just by himself for that night. Like not including <laughs> and paying the band. <laughs> I mean, the, the band, um, I highly, I mean, depends on the relationship he has with them, but it's, if it's a session band versus Metallica, where everyone gets kind of paid the same, or I don't know, maybe even Lars and, and uh, James Hetfield get paid more than the other guys. I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know. You, you don't know, but like you two, for example, you two have an agreement from my understanding that they all earn the same to kind of keep the camaraderie uh, positive. Pretty cool. And let's. In that case, you know, they're probably making less individually, but okay, then the venue, I would say for an act that size, I can't see them taking more than 10%. Uh, but then there's also, 
you know, the, the people who are working on the tour, not at that venue specifically. They're the ones who go around city to city and build the stage for you, make sure everything's working the way it's supposed to, the displays and all that. And uh, um, really above that is the above that is the artists and the management. I mean, the management is getting a massive portion, probably, you know, 20%. Um, a portion of that's going um, to the people under them who are managing the other managers. And then there's the road huh. crew that probably get less. There's a massive operation with those stadium tours, especially to do it in a short period of time. There's laws about how... The, the trucks are not allowed to drive more than a certain amount of hours. And if they don't make it to their tour date on time, then they're not going to be able to build the stage on time. And therefore the show doesn't happen. So like to make that happen on like a clockwork requires a lot of management, a lot of people. So it's, um, I mean, you're talking probably 5 million a show. So it's not like, you know, people are, people are getting paid good money, Yeah. but, um, you know, it's, that's that's uh, the ideal that you want to get to. He's a legacy act. He can go on tour whenever he wants and sell out 30,000 people. That is a dream. That's pretty awesome. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it totally was sold out. Like, it was wall-to-wall people. The band, um, to okay, to kind of dive in here and speculate, I mean, they were definitely, like, aging. Like, they were, they were older folks leading me to believe they'd been touring with him for a while. Uh, but then, what's the difference between, like, a session band? So that's that's just, like... A bunch of people that are basically employed by the headliner. Exactly, they're like uh, when Taylor Swift goes on tour, you know, she hires guitarists, drummers, the keyboard players, the violinists. Yeah. They're not like set parts of her. I mean, band. these people they're... look like they had been doing it since the seventies. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if you know they had they had known Eric for a while. But... Well, they probably get a much better deal. That's the <laughs> <laughs> that is the way to go. But I mean, it's uh, I mean, just to give some comparison. Um, this is like a rough. This is a rough guess. This is based on what I heard. But like when, when Bon Jovi goes on tour, you know, probably for a night, the uh, you know Richie Sambora probably made you know half a million, but the um, the other guitarist who's in the background probably made ten twenty k. Oh, that's interesting. So it's really interesting. So it's uh, and and of course like. You know, when you're doing a tour of I don't know 50 dates, I mean, you're making a solid six-figure living even as a guitar player. Yeah, 10, 20 k a night is not bad money, but it's not half a million, so there's disparity there. Exactly, and but you know that's kind of like to say that you know John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora, if they built the band from the very beginning, they're like the CEOs of the company. I mean, they kind of without them, it wouldn't run. Yeah. So that's. Well, and again, I mean, the, the act I saw was called Eric Clapton, which is a dude's name. <laughs> so it's, exactly. Yeah, you know, he's kind of the brand. Exactly, and and he can um, he can choose whoever he wants for his band. Like, um, I saw Guns N' Roses recently at the MetLife Stadium here. That was an incredible show. Like, they had nice. Slash and Duff McKagan back. Oh, that's cool. Um, but. But they had a, uh, you know, a, another guitar player who was played for Rihanna and whoever. I mean, he was an absolute beast as well. That's awesome. Um, from, from my understanding, like I actually think he's been in the band for the last like 15 years, probably. Um, he was, you know, filling in for the other guys for all those years, and now he's just, you know, because Izzy's not there, he's filling in for Izzy, and Slash is back. Yeah. So, and they had another guy replacing Slash for those years, you know. But that guy's probably and, uh, a mercenary who makes really good money. But maybe it's like you said, it's still like ten, twenty k a night. But man, that's a decent amount of coin, you know, when you consider there's three hundred sixty five nights in a year, and so if you worked all of them, that's like three point six million dollars. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that at that level, all those bands, whether it's Ozzy Osbourne, whoever, like, they're they probably have some sort of deal that they're probably even getting paid a salary. Who knows? Um, but it, if they're like a like a staple of the band, like they're you know the contract is that they're going to be in the band for 15 years. I mean, that's probably very different than just for a tour. So that's you know they're, they're obviously bringing way more value than just uh, coming in for that night to fill in. That's interesting. Play a but songs. I kind of wonder though. Like, I mean, okay, so I guess they've got value in that the audience knows who they are and is looking to see them there. 
But on the other hand, um, you know, if I'm a mercenary, um, as I am at work uh, a lot of the time, and I'm coming in to fill a difficult role to fill, like, you know, shredding on the guitar and being better than, you know, 99.99% of mortals that play in the guitar, I mean, surely that there's some leverage in that position too, because if I can, if I can chameleon into Rihanna or you know Metallica or Guns N' Roses or Eric Clapton, you know, or whoever, I mean, like, isn't there some value in that, you know, and just being good enough to be able to bend into any of those situations and and still kill it? Absolutely, there is. I mean, I my my favorite. Um, examples always uh, Max Martin who writes so many of the hits that we know um, or a Desmond Child or um, so writes so many of the hits since the, the 80s to now and you know they are at the level that they're probably bigger than the artist you know that is uh, you know they're not they are not the face of the brand but they are the backbone that they you know tour on without their songs they would not be you know without desmond child like you know without his contribution you wouldn't have living on a prayer for bon jovi yeah so i'm sure that you know that's a sort of a it's a very i'm sure it's a very individual thing at that level but i I know you know know for a fact that you know those guys are not doing anything for you know a couple grand that's not like you know they don't have time for that you know (laughs) Yeah, yeah i mean but that's that's they have so much um they have so much, um, I mean, even if, even if you just take the data of like their success, I mean, it's just, you can just use that to justify that. Like, you know, you're going to get this guy to write a song and not only that, but he has a network to like guarantee that people back you. And, you know, that, that's, uh, that's ultimately what you need. Uh, whether you're the front man or behind the scenes, like if you're able to pull some sort of weight, that is what, you're, you know, I, I, I mean, think of any jo- job application, or you know, if you're trying to becoming a become a VP versus a new hire. I mean, they have completely different weight that they're able to pull with their experience and their network and all that. And I guess we're we're all in that race, but it's it absolutely exists hardcore in the music industry. Yeah, yeah, that makes dis- sense. The difference is massive. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. and. So, like the things that I focus on the most, um, people come with, come to me with all kinds of questions. Like, it's, and and what I hear so often is that, like people are kind of chasing trends. They're trying to, um, they're looking at like, okay, this person that I really like is doing this. Like, I'm gonna try this now, and then they change their mind the next year and be like, I'm gonna be this. And that's of course the nature of the artist. Like, you want to explore all these things, and your creative mind is going wild, and you want to do everything. Um, I actually advocate for a much more like well balanced approach. I try to even advocate for five year plans where like if you're really um, looking to build something, you kind of have to figure out how you're going to con- like spend five years getting people to become aware of who you are and what you do. And if um, you know a lot of that time, you're really doing um, what a good mentor of mine calls a uh, dark work it's that work that you do when nobody's looking (laughs) the first couple of years nobody knows what you're developing but then you're developing this arsenal of stuff that you can just release and you have the backlog you know to be able to um even start focusing on other aspects not just the one thing that you were originally doing um you were uh typically when even with independent labels like you know i'll I'll send a song to them um a producer uh, will work on it with me and um you know probably for a couple months and then once it's officially done like it'll take another six months for it to actually come out because the labels have such like a backlog of what they're actually trying to get out there trying to figure out how to get it out the best way possible so that in that in itself if you start like right now it'll take at least a year for you to really start seeing the fruits of your labor if you want to like properly um secure the opportunities that you deserve um, and you know, then it takes another couple of years for people to even recognize what you do, and you know, become familiar with the, the whether it's you do one thing and you do it all the time, or it's a body of work that you want people to understand. And that takes even longer. I mean, you're going to have to really work five years to get people to 
become familiar with that message. Um, and you know that answer is different for everyone. Like I, you know, if you're gonna, it's definitely easier to do one thing really well and make sure everyone knows that and push that for five years. And you know, it doesn't matter if you go through the ups and downs. Sometimes you're cool, sometimes you're not. But at the end of the day, you if you outlast everyone else, then that is also like a, you know, what you have. Um, over pretty much anyone else who was just kind of floundering and not really knowing where to push, um, really regardless of kind of a budget. You know, the perseverance is really that that you know will will help you regardless of where you're coming from, where you're at when you're starting. So yeah, um, I can touch on a couple things that like I really the top four things that I want people to remember. And I'm like, this will probably branch off into a million different things, but, you know, community is the number one thing. We all, regardless of what industry you're you're in, you're trying to create a product for community, try to solve a certain problem or in music, um, whether it's, you know, you want to be known for a certain, consistently provide a certain mood that people can rely on, um, or you have a certain message with all your songs or you have a, whatever that is, you choose that thing. You listen to your audience, then you develop. The second thing is the content, which is, you know, of course, the product, or in your your case, probably the product. In our case, it's videos, music, um, you know, concerts, interviews, um, and then third. And why I put this third is because again, without the first two, this doesn't mean anything. Is third is the budget. You have to also look at, you know. Uh, I, I explain it this way, that you can be a, a hot dog stand in the middle of New York City. You can have the best hot dogs in the world and nobody will know you exist. <laughs> uh, like, you know, they will, you know, people will keep walking by until you start getting some referrals. Your and, signal you know, to noise I guess ratio we, is low. There's a lot of hot dog stands in New York City. Exactly. And that is literally the sea of artists that exist out there. Like, you know, how do you even know which one to start? How do people like how, like if you try to even identify? Oh, like you know that one at the corner of this and that street. Oh, well, I mean, there's like five other people there. <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> if you don't do anything to try to differentiate yourself and try to invest in like your brand recognition and the connections and the community, people. If you don't invest back in that, people will not know who you are. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's that's just kind of a common, common concept. And I say this because musicians often don't associate the art that they make with you know that side of industry it's to them them, it's this uh you know healing thing for them and you know they hope that other people feel the same way but there's also a million other people trying to do the same thing um, potentially and the last fourth thing again leads to the engagement i try to advocate for even recognizing income streams before you start investing because otherwise you might invest you can have a million dollars and invest it you know this that and it, you know this way and that way but like it might not mean anything and again, it comes right back around to the community if it doesn't mean anything it's a total waste of time and money so those are the things that I try to focus on and I feel like when I explain that like because the artist brain is you know I want to do this I want to do that I think it helps people visualize a little bit better how to perhaps maybe focus on their strengths. Maybe they need to, you know, maybe they are already doing the right things, but they're not investing in the right places. Um, And I'm, you know, even for myself, again, like the reason why I think the EDM thing hit off for me was because um, the songs. I was writing just worked over dance beats better than better than others. It started connecting with those people, and that worked. Nice. Um, and that didn't cost anything. I mean, I just had to start talking to the right people. Maybe I was in the wrong community. Um, so I try to offer all these different angles, um, and I try to take it as far as um, kind of explaining how I like, I roughly view like the next the Netflix model of like you know you're competing with not only with all these people trying to do the same thing as you but like people with uh, massive platforms who are able to churn out this content on a weekly basis like i love the dance music labels because they're able they found a way to like 
you know, literally put out at least a song for a week on, on a label and like keep people engaged in that community. And honestly, with the amount of stuff we have going on, if you're not engaging in that, you're not as competitive as you should be. You're not really guaranteeing yourself a spot at the table like these people are. And and with that said, again, you were, if you find a solution that doesn't cost you as much money, that's fantastic. But if you, um, you know, that's, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to spend Netflix money to become, you know, noticed. But it, it means that you have to engage in similar practices and thinking, like how do we fill up the year with content that make our community enjoy what we do. So when you say budget, what you're really talking about is budgeting time and money in order to market your brand. Uh, you're not talking about adhering to a fixed budget. You're talking about just making sure you set aside a budget to pursue the mission, if that's accurate. Exactly. And, and any any startup um, founder, you know, whether... I mean, they have whether it's music or some other product. You have to think to yourself, like, okay. Um, I mean, I know to the nearest hundred dollars what the podcast costs me to make, you know, every month, and I have it budgeted aside, and you know, it always gets spent. So. Exactly, and so like all I'm really saying with that is whether you're approaching it from the point of view that you have a million dollars and trying to figure out how to spend it. Or if you were, you know, making 15 bucks an hour and just trying to figure out how do I spend, you know, I don't know, I mean, just throwing out a number, 100 bucks a month to grow what I do. How do we use that wisely? Um, I, I think I'm sure that if you um, pry enough, I'm sure that Elon or Bill Gates or, you know, they probably have something that they would love to do but don't have enough money for. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, artists are definitely, artists are 100% this way like there's a million things i would love to do i love to explore but you know time and money are limited yeah. so we have to try, try to figure out ways to make that work and then well, that's kind of what i've been in the business of it's interesting music yeah for sure and and that's that's a healthy way to think about it i think i mean for me it's been interesting because there's stuff i want to do for the sake of doing it and then there's other stuff i want to do because i'm pretty sure it'll make money and i feel like um in my recent professional development, I've started to prioritize stuff that I think will make money over stuff that I just want to do for the fuck of it. And so I think that's a big difference is, you know, like, okay, I'll, I'll see this money again if I spend it this way versus like, wouldn't this be cool to build, you know, this crazy, you know, looking robot spider. You know, like that seems like fun, but I'm not going to make any money on that. So maybe that's not a good use of finances. <laughs> so. I mean, I was, um, I don't know, I was, uh, I'm always like really interested when people do decide to, you know, try these completely experimental companies. It's like, it, I mean, I guess on some level, the founders have decided that they're just willing to go through with that, regardless if it's successful or not, and to see yeah. what happens. Like, I guess you have to. Um, Sometimes money is not the I, goal for people. I mean, a lot of people just want to make their art, you know, as it were. Right. And and so I, I try not to view... Because you don't... You never truly know how something is going to unfold. You try the, your very best to plan ahead and figure out, like, okay, like, like a chess game, like, how do I get to that checkmate point as, like, fast as possible? Um, you you try you try everything, but like if you don't view your participation as like a uh, what's that like art of war thing like the infinite game, like um, you know if, you, if you're art of war. it's like it's, it's something about the you know the game is infinite and if you choose to you lose if you choose to drop out and like so um, I think it's much healthier to think about your participation as like you pick a number that you're comfortable with like you're willing to technically. I mean, you're obviously trying to make it work, but if even if you lost the money, never made it back, you'd be happy with what you did with it. Pick that number, invest that in what you what you love, and try to try to grow it. And if you do that consistently over, you know, five ten years, I'm I can guarantee that you won't be in the same place that you started as long as you utilize some you know critical thinking along the way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
And I will say, like, there's a lot of, at least from an art perspective, I mean, there's a lot of stuff where I feel like, you know, it sort of refuses to sell out and is there for better art, you know, where, like, I don't know, Quentin Tarantino's movie has come to mind where I feel like you would never have, like, Disney, you know, put in, like, make a movie like Django Unchained, right? But it's an amazing movie because it's a dude that, you know, has the discretion to direct it the way he wants to and has a good vision. And the result is, is amazing. You know, it's really, really good. I mean, I feel like maybe South Park to some extent when it, when it was started may, might have been like that. Now it's kind of a sure bet because enough people like it that, you know, it's going to make money even if the episodes have started kind of sucking a little bit. You know, it's, uh, I definitely feel, uh, picking that part even further, I don't think that maybe maybe Quentin Tarantino doesn't exactly think about it this way, but my attempt, let's say, at trying to even pick it apart and try to figure out how to explain it as a short success, even if you don't necessarily know from the start. Um, I mean, he's trying to satisfy some emotional need or like tell some sort of story that he like. Even if he can't fully explain it at first, I mean, he's creating something that he knows the audience craves emotionally, an emotional release of some sort. Yeah. Um, so, and I wish honestly that, you know, this was, this was taken more seriously. Like, you know, like art wasn't just seen as a, is isn't me personally. I wish art wasn't seen as a secondary thing in the economy. Like I wish it was taken a little bit more seriously in the sense that like, it really brings value to people, whether it's just a healing thing or a, uh, emotional release after a long week of work. I mean, people are obviously paying for this for a reason. Like, if you're able to tap into, like, I try to tap into something like that personally. Like, whenever I do a DJ gig, I think about the people who are coming, you know, out after a long week of work and they want release. Nice. And if I don't provide that, then I don't feel like I did a good job. Yeah. So, like, I'm sure that there's some sort of th- some sort of thought process that could be utilized. I just don't know what Quinton's thinking. Oh, that's um, interesting. Um, I feel like he I doesn't give a fuck what people think, uh, but maybe that's just what he wants you to think. And you know, but maybe that's exactly the thing because yeah. he approaches it from that point of view. You come out of the movie being like, "Fuck yeah, I, I, you know, I got you got the release that you're looking for." Yeah, no, for it always is, and I mean, there definitely is some deliberate like creating a horrible villain and just setting them up to be killed in a spectacular way is like one of Quentin Tarantino's party pieces in a bunch of different movies. Like just showing them doing something egregious and evil, you know, and like over and over and over again to like a bunch of different people that you liked, you know, before they got murdered in some horrible way by this villain. And then, you know, just setting them up for like this, you know, massive downfall. I mean, that's, that's like a Tarantino party piece. And you're right, that does require some empathy with the audience's position in order to, you know, make it work tonally. I mean, because if it was just gratuitous violence and, you know, with without any intention or, or thinking or foreshadowing or storyboarding, it wouldn't work the same way. Mm. And like Christopher Nolan, how he unpacks like an Oppenheimer story. Like, I know you, you already know what it's about. Yeah. It was, it was, I gotta it was watch that. Good. I, ha- I haven't seen it yet. I, I, I should watch that. I did the Barbenheimer thing. I saw the Barbie movie and Oppenheimer back to back. <laughs> I, I heard the Barbie was, movie uh, was good. My dad liked it, of all people. Um, and the old boomer doesn't like a whole lot of stuff, so <laughs> yeah, it must be good. I thought, I thought it was good. It was like there were some moments where it's kind of like, haha, okay, like you know, it's like intellectual funny. Like not just laugh out loud funny, huh. but it's like they did that with a Barbie yeah. movie. Yeah, it was really like surprisingly like intellectual, like had a lot bigger societal message to it than what you would expect. That's interesting. Yeah, that's, that's... and Oppenheimer was more emotional than I expected. Huh. Kind of getting yeah, you would have thought that head. would be kind of flipped, and so that's that's really interesting. So, yeah. I mean, they it might not have been designed to do so, but I guess the fact those came out at the same time and, you know, like they probably do play well together. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it was, uh, um, it was, 
amazing to see these double features too. Like before the before that, it was I think it was a Mission Impossible and Indiana Jones. Like I'd love to see movie theaters do that more. Like I actually yeah. spent the whole day at the cinema. Like it was totally worth it. That's cool. Like, I got to get back to the cinema. I didn't even see the new Indiana Jones movie. I'll be honest. After the Crystal Skull, I just wanted nothing to do with Indiana Jones. <laughs> so. <laughs> I would love to be told I'm wrong here and that I should see the new one because I'll watch it because I, I you know, obviously I'm you know Harrison Ford is great and Spielberg's done a lot of good stuff and you know it's all it's all good I just the Crystal Skull was so terrible like I, I just kind of swore off Indiana Jones after that. What did you feel was the most terrible thing about Crystal Skull that turned you off? That's fair. Um, I guess, like, the alien theme was, like, a little bit hokey, I thought, in the context of the Indiana Jones universe. Um, I guess some of the stuff felt, like, kind of callbacky to the older Indiana Jones, but without doing its own thing. But, I mean, it's an Indiana Jones. It's not, like, you know, high art. Like, it's supposed to be a little bit schlocky, you know? I mean, there's, like, Nazis with melting faces and stuff in Indiana. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, it's... Yeah. I just, I don't know, true. like, like the, you know, there's like, and not to be a total nerd, but like, there's that scene where like, there's an atomic bomb and they like hide in a refrigerator and somehow that protects them. And so the suspension <laughs> yeah. of disbelief kind of goes away. Um, but, you know, again, there's like, I don't know, I, I watched James Bond as a kid and like the, none of that's scientifically accurate at all. So, you know, maybe, but then you look back at some of that and you're like, oh my God, this is sexist. <laughs> like, you know, like, this is, <laughs> can't believe I ever watched this. Like, this is really bad. <laughs> That is true. So, yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, that is incredible how the character has evolved. I mean, to be completely honest, the newest movies. I, I like the aesthetic of those types of movies. Um, so I guess it's kind of like it, maybe it's just one of those things that you know, like Batman: Dark Knight came out at that right time, or like. I'm a teenager and it like hit that angst chord with me. And it's like, you know, that can that thing kind of works for me, but it's like when that is, when I see a movie of that aesthetic, I somehow like gravitate towards it. And it's like the dark, but slightly like intellectual. Um, like when it comes to like scary movies or like anything, like if there's that little like mystery or something, that's like slightly like, like, Ooh, like, I don't quite know what's going on, but I have to watch it to find out. And that's like, I, I need that. Like, I, I don't, like, I don't really watch, like, I need something to satisfy that inquisitive side. Something has to unfold that's unexpected. Otherwise yeah. I feel like, okay, like, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I love, you know, watching, let's say like Hell's Kitchen just as much as anyone else. But it's like after a while, it turns into like repetitive and you're like, OK, like I've watched enough episodes. I know what's happening here. And like that's I got to break this binge habit because you know, I'm not getting anything yeah. out of this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, and, and I agree, like creativity, like that's why I love a show like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia is because like it manages to remain interesting and fresh and relevant even though they've done like what like 16 seasons now or something. And so I, I feel like I mean that's obviously a comedy but like they they keep it interest like the like they keep coming up with just zany out of the box concepts that they haven't done yet and so and and you know it's like they're very self-aware and I feel like um like Frank falls out the window or like you know the gang replaces D with a monkey. Like, I mean, there's some interesting, you know, just, yeah, like even the name is funny. And then like, um, like D falls into a bog. Like, I don't know. Like they had that whole Ireland season that was funny. And they, that scene where they jumped like a Ford F one fifty like over a bog in Ireland, like while playing the star spangled banner. Like that was hilarious to me. Like they, they just managed to keep it. Um, I don't know if you saw like Frank versus Russia in the new season, but that one was really good. I don't want to get spoilers, it but it's based off a true story. <laughs> when I wow. found that out, that was more hilarious than the, the premise of the episode, like knowing that it was real. But uh, I don't want to get spoilers. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I have to I have to catch up on all that. See, it's like there's so many. Um, I can't even keep up with all the shows that are coming out. There's a. I mean, there's there's some of the Star Wars things, like the Obi-Wan Kenobi series and the new one, the Ahsoka one. I haven't even watched I yet. I haven't watched that like, yet. 
it's on my list. I'll probably start it next week. <laughs> Let me know what what's good there, because like I grew up watching Star Wars, but I mean that's another one where I think I've gotten a little disillusioned just with the sheer volume of stuff Disney's releasing. Where I'm like, I can't be invested in this anymore. Like there's just so much crap coming out. Like say what you want about the prequels. Like I mean they they and they did suck, but like <laughs> easy to be an armchair critic, you know. But. Uh, what I will say is, you know, at least they didn't release them so frequency frequently that you weren't like kind of curious what the next one was going to be like. Like, like yeah, the Phantom Menace was terrible, but like, it's been three years, so maybe Attack of the Clones will be better. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, that Darth Maul fight scene made up for everything. Yeah, it was That's good. Carried the whole movie. Yeah. And same thing. Like, there's, there's a. Uh, I think what made me feel. Um, sort of like the the sequel trilogy was wrong. I think that you know it's fine that the first movie set things up the way that it did, but then it really went off the rails for me because it's like it you're talking about the three latest Disney ones. Yeah, it, it's just it, it completely threw out the window what you um, kind of came to see a Star Wars movie for. You wanted to see these epic heroes be able to do awesome things. I guess kind of like what, you know, Marvel did that perfectly, you know, with the, I mean, I, I, even some of the movies that they're doing now are still fine, but I mean, they're, they're kind of, you know, starting to fall off the rails too with like too much content, but like the way that they were going from like, you know, from Iron Man on. Iron like, Man was know, good. That was, <laughs> and they just kept, they built this universe. And it's become almost like a blueprint for what everyone else wants to do now. Yeah. But like, I, I sometimes you just don't, they don't even have some some universes just don't have that whatever that is to like that brings it together in that way it's not as satisfying when others others do it like you know it's uh even though that is an ideal i mean like it star wars tried to do it perhaps they could have pulled it off but the way that they did it writing wise just was underwhelming Oh, that's interesting. Wasn't given, yeah. It wasn't given that feeling I expected, you know? It kind of felt like they just tried to tell the same story over and over again, like with the new Star Wars movie. Like, I I got a feeling they were just kind of ripping off A New Hope, you know? And, like, you know, they're just like, Death Star, Death Star, there's got to be a Death Star, you know? And they even kind of had yeah. that self-referential, you know, like they, they sort of broke the fourth wall with, like, you know, Harrison Ford, you know, talking about like a ventilation shaft or whatever in the one scene, you know, and I don't know. I mean, like, I, I feel like, it yeah, ultra it's, nostalgia. It's not, yeah, exactly, but it's no longer compelling storytelling. It's just, you know, trying to hit the nostalgia buttons, which they did a good job of that. But I mean, I don't know. Like at a certain point, like you can't just coast on that alone. It's like the the what is it the um. Transformers movie is where like it's just all special effects with no storyline and Michael Bay you know just throwing special effects at the ah to have another explosion you know but you know none of the story is going to be comprehensible and I feel like it kind of came off a little bit that way yeah it's like I I just again that inquisitive side of my brain once I figure out this is going on is kind of like like, where's the... They, I, I start thinking of ways that it could have been more. And I feel like that's bad. <laughs> like, when yeah. I'm as a viewer trying to think of, like, well, how could this have been better? That is a little bit... I think that's when you kind of start listening. But, I don't know. I'm not Disney, so I can't... Yeah, <laughs> I would love to I'd love to work for them and try, but, like, you know, that's the... Um, I don't know if they'll take me with my... <laughs> <laughs> if I criticize their Star Wars, so I don't know. <laughs> we can edit it out if you want. I mean, uh, no, it's okay. Plenty of shit I, I talk think that I've, I've taken out of the episodes. <laughs> it's like I, I think I think what's I think what's valuable about this is that it shows. This is again a point that like you can have all the money in the world, all the you know, um, you can pull out all the tricks with the, you have all the latest technology, you got all the best actors, you can you've hire acquired you a want. successful brand that you're starting from, so you're the popular kid already walking into the room. Exactly, and it's still possible to completely mess it up. Yeah, I mean, from the point of view of a lot of a lot of viewers, um, and you know, it's a uh, it's it's tough. It doesn't it it's a uh, I I believe that with all every project, you got to try to come come to the plate and make it the best that you can. Don't like 
I, I personally like I love nostalgia here and there, but like if you rely on nostalgia, then that's kind of like, you know, I could have. Uh, let's say I go to a rave or something, and I see Skrillex, and if he only played the stuff that he played ten years ago, exactly the same way. I mean, it doesn't feel the same anymore. It's, and it starts to feel like, okay, like, are you doing anything new? Um, yeah. I love to, you, you gotta have, you have, you have to, you know, you, you can, you could have too much of a good thing. And, yeah. And that's not even good anymore. <laughs> no, I agree. Um, I mean, um, I'd much rather see an artist I like doing something I haven't seen before than to see them do like the exact same thing they did on an album, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, because where's the fun in that? I mean, I could just listen to the album. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I kind of think these points all, you know, no matter what you, choose the company wise like whether it's entertainment or whatever else i think it kind of it, it applies i mean there's my, my goal if i you know my personal desire would be that we remove as many barriers as possible like you know that gatekeep good ideas out you know in favor of just you know money and loyalty and all that like if you're able to create the landscape into like a arena where the best ideas win, you know, the people who are most engaged with their community win, that would be ideal. It doesn't matter if you have a, you know, massive brand or not, like you're able to um, be recognized for what it, what it is you're trying to create for your audience. If you're doing it well, um, it's not, as easy as that though and, that, and that's like the i think by explaining more by it you know i, I hate to use the term educating I'm, i don't want to like talk down to anyone i'm just trying to explain what i see but like if i i think by explaining some sort of frameworks for thinking about scaling and all that could be expanded if everyone had the tools to kind of be sort of their own ceo took that responsibility we would probably see a even more dynamic um uh, i don't know entertainment industry politics like you know name it like you know if everyone did that that would be probably the ideal um but that's you know i, I try to i try to help people get as close as that as possible because that's freedom to me that's freedom yeah that's awesome when i will say like um I feel like my company has experienced, you know, a significant uptick um, recently, and, and we did better last year than we did the year before that. And I think it's it's moving up at the moment. I mean, we'll see, you know, kind of what the future holds. But right now, things are good. And I think a lot of that comes down to um, just having a more concerted, you know, eye toward the future, to your point, and, and kind of planning and thinking about, you know, the sort of things that we need to do by what dates in order to get to a place we want to be. But then another one is, um, you know, just having a concerted, well, I guess this kind of goes hand in hand, but having a concerted sales and marketing effort and continuing to, you know, put time and money there and just, you know, think about it strategically and then execute tactically, you know, the things you need to do to, to get where you're trying to be. And, I mean, that's... To me, I mean, this is contrasted to, like, earlier in my career. I mean, I would spend, you know, lots and lots of money on just things I thought were cool for the sake of doing a cool thing. You know, like, I'm talking about like when I used to do battle bots. Like, there's no money in that, but, like, I enjoyed it, and so I, I did that. I mean, there's certain R&D projects I've authorized funding for and spent my own money on where... Yeah, there's no money to be made there, but I diverted resources away from rainmaking where it should have been spent in order to, you know, do something I just thought was interesting for me as an artist. And I feel like, you know, even if it's a robotics project, it's still a kind of art. And so I feel like there's there's a similarity there, sort of in that in that philosophy. Have you seen that? Uh, even that scene um, from the new Mission Impossible where it's Tom Cruise, like, like. Does the bicycle, uh, not bicycle, the motorbike jump off the cliff? No, no, that sounds awesome. 
Like, can you imagine? I, I don't. I don't. He even does know his own stunts, to, right? Like he's, he's actually like doing that himself. I'm told. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like you know, dropping the bike and parachuting off. Like that's like. <laughs> that's so cool. That's you know, like he has to do it multiple times. Like, you know, to get it right, you know, potentially. I don't know how many times they had to do that, but, like, how many bikes are they dropping into the ravine over there? Like, Yeah, know. it can't like, be cheap. Yeah. And, like, not to mention, like, can you imagine the insurance policy that, like, Tom Cruise has to have in case of injury? I mean, like, I'm sure that's expensive as hell. They'd probably make him sign something special, like, <laughs> this is your fault if you <laughs> Yeah, dude, you this. shouldn't have done your own stunts. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, use someone expendable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can't honestly I, I can't imagine for stuntmen like you know they're going in the line of work intentionally looking to hurt yourself it's like I don't think they're looking sure to hurt themselves I mean I would imagine <laughs> oh, no, I mean, it's probably an adrenaline like, thing to some extent I mean I don't think they make crazy money like when I was in LA I was talking to one I mean they might get like ten, fifteen thousand dollars a gig but they only do like a few gigs a year so you know I mean it's yeah, that's that's the game they're in. Um, I started uh, so the other weekend, someone took me out uh, to fly an airplane, which was really cool. And I think I'm gonna nice. probably get my private pilot's license, or at least try. I don't know. I probably shouldn't say that on here because that'll reduce my motivation to do it. But it, right now, it seems genuinely fun, and I signed up for lessons like the next few weekends, and we'll see how far I get with it. I think I'm gonna try to follow through assuming you know I, I go all the way down the line with it that's awesome are you flying those uh, one of the smaller cessna planes like the the one um yeah propeller in the front Sing, single engine prop plane uh yeah. last uh few weekends ago was a grumman tiger and so um mm -hmm. it was cool it was like all um cloth upholstery on the inside like you know it was it was kind of like a Ford Taurus in the sky. It's <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a lot of fun. Um, and um, me and was that one, scary? It was at first. Um, so I definitely was, um, you know, shitting myself figuratively speaking a little bit at the start. Um, but then I sort of thought about it, and I'm like, you know, if I do fall out of the sky, I mean, there's not really very much I can do about it, and so there's no point in worrying about it. And I mean, you know, why I would volunteer to do it again if that's my attitude? You know, I don't know. But it was it was really fun and like flying. OK, so we flew from like one little regional airport to another, had dinner and then flew back. That's that's all it was. And like when I first got the controls, I was terrified. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to crash this thing in the ground, like blah, 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 blah. And then I, you know, I, I sort of like it didn't crash. I mean, there were like a few like adrenaline rushes when I, you know, did maneuvers for me that were like a little bit more difficult. But like the guy that was flying mainly, Alex Fossil, who I had on the podcast, you know, said, hey, look, I'm going to take the plane back if you do anything at all where I'm even slightly alarmed. And like, I've been doing this for a while. So like, don't worry, dude, like we're, we're going to be OK. I'm like, all right. Yeah, that's fair. And so I, I just turned around like 360 degrees. Um, and he goes, okay, I'll do that again, but this time use the rudder. And so I did that again, but I, I used another control surface, which made it a much more controlled turn. And then um, he was like, okay, now fly in this direction. And then we got close to the airport we were flying to. He took over, landed. We took off again. He's like, all right, now climb to you know 3,500 feet and like maintain this heading. And so you know, I was like overshooting a little bit, and then I kind of got the hang of it. But the flight back was like a lot sort of like i don't want to say less scary but like it was it became less eventful like you know that the initial sort of like you know like ah well the awe was still there like it was still an amazing feeling to be flying a plane but the initial fear kind of dissipated like the first landing in a plane that small was kind of scary right i mean i still sort of brace for landing in a commercial plane even though i fly you know maybe like you know five to eight times a year or so i'll fly some maybe maybe more than that uh maybe less like during covid it, you know certainly less during covid but you know i mean i'm i'm in the sky and like a commercial airline or a decent amount probably i mean i don't know what the average person flies but i'm thinking it's probably less than me and i still kind of i'm like you know like putting my spine straight and like getting ready to land and like 
you know, in the small mm-hmm. one, like you can, you, it's really in, like you can you can see the the skid marks on the on the landing strip where like other planes have like actuated their brakes and you know, and it's the thing is kind of shaking and you know, it's sort of just a little bit the wind's bitch, and so I mean I don't know like you sort of you sort of get used to it. You're like okay, you know, I didn't get hurt last time, so I'll probably be fine, you know. And so I don't know. I, I can imagine. I guess it's kind of like a. Uh when you uh like first let's say you first start driving a sports car or something it's like it's awesome like when you get to like really like hit the gas on it but then if, if you got to drive it and commute and then it's probably like like okay like you know it's <laughs> you can't really like you know do the um uh i mean i i, I don't i have no clue what goes into being a fighter pilot but like that's probably like super exhilarating yeah like you like you get to do all the crazy stuff all the time. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, those planes are insane. I was flying a plane from the seventies, you know, <laughs> like it still kept up and it was still fun um, and, and amazing and, and quite an experience. And thank you, Alex, for inviting me to do that. But, you know, I mean, it's not like a fighter plane. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I didn't take off. I didn't land. I mean, hopefully I'll get to do that stuff if I stay the course here. And, and learn how but what i like about it is also like the idea of you know say i've got to go to new york for work or like to visit the family like i love the idea that like i could get there in a couple of hours or a few hours um you know and, and spend really not a whole lot more than i'd spend on a commercial airline ticket and not have to deal with the tsa and be able to take whatever luggage i wanted and you know, show up and and just get to the airport, jump in the plane, take the trip, land, you know, jump on the subway, you know, go visit the folks and head home, you know, and and like that that seems that's really awesome. Nice. Yeah, like just like a new level of like you know, it's like when you get your first car and all of a sudden you know you're no longer constrained to the bus system. Yeah, exactly. Go places. <laughs> that's that's kinda, awesome. I. I never considered um, how, how easy. Like, do you do you then like rent the plane for like the day? Is that kind of how it works, or like? Yeah. So, at least the way I looked at doing it, um, you rent through a flying club. Well, you sort of rent. Like, you're a part owner uh, by virtue of paying dues, and it's not as expensive as you would think. Um, and you pay this due. Um, I think it was like two hundred dollars a month. And then, like, the flight time on, like, the Grumman Tiger I flew was, like, $125 an hour, but only for hours that the plane is actually having life put on the engine. So while you're in the sky, it's $125 an hour. And then when you're on the ground again, the clock isn't ticking, and then you just fly back and, you know, you pay for the time you put on the plane. Like, it's probably a awesome. teeny bit more expensive than flying commercial, but if you bring a second person, it's cheaper. <laughs> so... Exactly, and you're not inconvenienced by like you know the amount of time you're at the airport. It's probably a couple hours, like both ways, and like yeah, I mean that's that's living the dream. I I have a friend who started taking some lessons. He hasn't gotten all the way to um, like really flying on his own. He did a couple lessons, but he was he he loves the idea of like his dream would to be to never touch the ground. He'd always want to like go from hop from one place to another. He works, he works remotely. So he'll be in like a different place, like all the time. So that's probably like his dream. That's awesome. But that sounds like, I mean, if I could do that, I would do that too. You could do that. <laughs> I would love that. I will yeah. do it. Perhaps uh, we'll talk in 10 years from now and we'll all be just like hopping around in uh, some sort of, uh, I don't know, some sort of drone jet, like, <laughs> <laughs> like what are those things with the um they're starting to release like in the um in the in the in the in the deserts of Dubai or something you have these like with the Joby like vertical takeoff and landing um like, yeah like it's kind of like a quad rotor I think yeah and it, to me it looks like a like like a drone like a video drone or something but it's yeah. like you're big enough to have a person in it and that's pretty brilliant I mean that's probably I wonder how long it takes for that to become the next thing. Yeah, but then you think, I mean, we've had helicopters, you know, for many decades now. I mean, there's there's definitely technology that does that already that's out there. And those things are cool. Would you say that, 
Would you say that those things are, are they safer than a helicopter? Because you have all these extra insurance, like all these different... Well, the helicopter's still got redundancy. Like, you've got, like, two turbines um, in a helicopter, I think, and if one of them fails, the other one can still land the helicopter. Uh, I guess if you lose your prop, you're probably pretty fucked. But, um, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't looked deeply into it, but I, there's a lot of safety systems, and, and, like, a lot of it comes down to the pilot and the engineering. I mean... Like, at least with the plane, you know, I remember um, talking to Alex about um, the auxiliary fuel pump. So the engine in one of these single engine prop planes has a fuel pump built into it. And, you know, while it's turning, it's pumping fuel from the wings or where the gas is stored. So it's pumping fuel from the wings or from either wing. You kind of switch over which wing you want to pull fuel from. And you're supposed to switch fuel tanks every 30 minutes. Uh, and there's a switch in the middle that lets you do that. And then um, there's the auxiliary fuel pump, which is electric. And so when you take off, you want to engage the auxiliary fuel pump. You you get up to speed because you need all the juice you can get because you're just trying to accelerate like you know as fast as you can. Then you know you get into the sky. You switch off the auxiliary fuel pump and you go on the fuel pump that's in the uh, the engine. But then if that fails and you know the fuel pump breaks or whatever you start to uh the engine will stall and so then you the steps you're supposed to take are i think it's you know first you identify a suitable place to land that you can get to then um you know what you're supposed to do is i'm gonna get this wrong so i'm, I'm sorry in advance I'm, I'm taking lessons i haven't really gotten involved yet but i think from there what you do is you um try to engage the auxiliary fuel pump and you see if that, you know, gets you, um, you know, the engine working again. So you can, you can sort of reignite. And I, I, I think because you're flying, you know, the propeller is, is driving. And so, you know, the starter, you don't really even need, but it's more, you know, like, Hey, if the main fuel pump failed, the auxiliary will get fuel in there again. And that might be your issue. And then if that doesn't work, there might be one other step, and then you have to emergency land. And so, I mean, there's you can glide. I mean, there's 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 redundancies there. And so, you know, if you're properly trained and you're thinking about it the right way, you know, I mean, there's things you can do to kind of get out of trouble. And you're supposed to run through a checklist every time you take off. Well, that sounds good. I definitely, uh, I mean, with all those redundancies, I'm glad that it's uh, definitely in place. <laughs> I mean, imagine just not having that, and just like people flying around. I mean, that's. Uh, <laughs> I guess people learn the hard way. Yeah, for sure. Got to this point, but um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Like, um, based on what you do on a daily basis, like how how much you see like across the board. But it's like, do you think that? Um, well, I'll just ask it. I'm not usually like following tons of conspiracy things but what do you think of that whole like like alien congress thing and oh i don't know anything about that to be honest holding on to some sort of crazy technology like, is that possible i'm so i'm so far in the dark on that like i i wouldn't consider myself qualified to answer that question like i i'm just i just don't know i mean i've i've talked to my friends that's about what, that that's what, that's what they'd want you to say <laughs> maybe but like Perhaps. I don't know. I mean, I, I've talked to my friends about it. Um, you know, I I kind of maintain an intentional ignorance with regard to some current events, and so I've only really you know watched so much of that footage and and you know seen so many of the things people are talking about. But I mean, it's interesting. Like I, I it seems to have surpassed conspiracy theory and gotten to the point where like it seems to be being widely discussed, but. Again, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like, just to be honest, what's your opinion? I'm just curious about, like, I mean, I love to, like I said in the beginning, like, I love to know what the nature of the universe is, and I definitely don't. I think it's just kind of um, naive to think that something, you know, greater than ourselves is impossible. Sure. But it's... um. I'm also interested in like the technological possibility. Like, I don't care whether it's like a U.S. government thing or if it's an actual alien thing. Like, 
who knows if it's uh, you know what's actually going on, but the, the potential behind it, like you know, just thinking about like how where we could take ourselves if yeah. something like this is possible is like mind blowing. So I mean, you like know, statistically, kind of, oh, sorry after you. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna say statistically, I mean, we're probably not alone in the universe. It's really, really big. Uh, I don't know. I mean, like, just if you look at the numbers, like, you know, like how many billions or trillions or whatever of stars, like there's like an infinite amount of universe. And so we're probably not the only intelligent life out there. I mean, I would think. But, you know, on the other hand, you know, if the Earth were visited by an alien intelligence, you know, and again, I, I want to be careful what I say here because I, I don't know. But hypothetically speaking, if the, if the Earth were visited by an alien intelligence, like, would they really only tell the U.S. government, like, you know, what's what would stop them from making contact with other people and, you know, animals or whatever? Like, I don't know. Like, how would they how would they keep that a secret, you know? And so uh, it's that's sort of my open ended philosophical speculation on it, if that makes sense. Like, I, I again, I don't know, but like intuitively, I, I, you know, like, it seems like the puzzle pieces don't quite fit to me. Like, um, I guess really then, like, my question would be that, like, is it possible to even keep something like that a secret? Like, you know, let's say, like, a company tries, a private company tries their best to keep, um, you know, um, something under wraps that they're working on. Like, how long can you even get away with doing that before, like, people start spilling the beans? I mean, it depends on the scale of your operation. You know, I guess, um, I don't know. Um, I mean, there have been some pretty big operations kept a secret, you know, like, I mean, D-Day, for instance, you know, when you look at, like, World War II and the amount of folks that it took to invade Europe, um, I mean, that that's a pretty big secret, and, you know, like, the Germans didn't adequately defend those beaches to keep us out, and we got through, luckily. You know? and so, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you know, it's you can keep pretty big secrets like that. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, yeah. I mean, a lot of times things do get out, and it, I think it. A lot of it comes down to sort of just being selective in what information you release out there um, and, you know, sort of protecting yourself that way. So, I don't it makes know. sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't know. I don't really follow this stuff religiously, but it's like it's interesting. It's an interesting thought experiment to me to consider, like, like even if, like, one piece of it was – Let's say you just take it as fact, and where where could where would you go with with that information? Like, you know, does that? I would like to think that you know, having an example of something that is more advanced than ourselves is like, and I guess that's like you know, religion for most people, I suppose. But it's sure. like, for me, it's like a more tangible way to think about that. Like, oh, like you know, they figured something out that we haven't figured out. Like, how do we do that? Like, you know, that might make us better. Like, that's um. And do you find that in um, I probably more so in like you know research and you know universities you find people with kind of blending a little bit more fan, uh, fantasy projects with reality but like how often do you see um, see that especially while you're at university I mean I, I would say I see more impressive things in my career nowadays than I saw when I was at university um, I mean just you know being out there like I mean I, I you know like interning at SpaceX, like I saw a lot of interesting things when I was there that not a lot of people knew about at the time. And I'm sure, you know, like if I were to go back now, there'd be a lot of interesting stuff where I'd be like, huh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, and then, I mean, some of the other places I've been, I mean, you, you do see, I mean, it's like a museum that isn't a museum yet, right? Like, it's, it's like, you know, if you go to the Science Center or the Natural History Museum, you're like, wow, that's incredible. And then you see the new shit that isn't in a museum yet or publicly known. You're like, oh, my God. You're like, this is incredible and not that many people know about this. And so, I mean, sure. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I would love to... Um, 
Well, what would what would I need to learn in order to get involved in a project like that? Well, I just, just learn more about learn more about um, you know hardware, or software. Like how how do I, how do you get involved in these kinds of projects? Uh, like R and D robotics projects. Yeah, like what would like what if you were starting out today? Like what would be like the thing to to pick up in your opinion? That's interesting. I mean, a lot of it's just for me at least. My current position comes from you know twenty years experience building robots. I mean, like you know, a lot of it was you know just you know I started messing around with electronics, then mechanical stuff. Um, you know, and then writing writing a little bit of software and understanding the full system, which makes me a good systems engineer um, and manager of folks. Um, trying to understand how people work, so like reading the Dale Carnegie book and gaining experience in management. Um, I mean, there's. I guess if I could do it all over again and I could change something in my career to be able to to get in bigger sooner. Um, Assuming that I didn't have my problems with authority, you know, maybe working for like a bigger company right out of school would have been a way to sort of jumpstart the experience. So, you know, going somewhere with just a boatload of resources and spending a little bit of time there, um, you know, learning how they do it and then maybe going somewhere else with a boatload of resources. I mean, maybe even a competitor and learning how they do it. Um, I mean, going back a step up from that, um, I mean, the money is in software, I would say. I mean, there's also money in hardware, but, you know, certain types of software engineers tend to get paid pretty well. Um, controls engineers are very scarce right now. Um, perception engineers are incredibly valuable at the moment. Autonomy engineers are incredibly valuable at the moment. Um, I mean, you need a knowledge of robotic algorithms. Um, you need experience applying those things. Um, maybe in order to have the algorithms knowledge, like some advanced mathematics helps. Um, and then like understanding programming languages and, and the actual implementation side um, so that you can sort of tear apart the code. And really a lot of it these days comes to implementing like libraries uh, that are off the shelf, um, whether they're open source or some closed source middleware play. Uh, that's a big part of it. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's what, what attracts me to robotics is that it's multidisciplinary in nature. And I like that it's, you acquires a diverse enough array of skills that not very many people could do it. And so it's kind of special. <laughs> so I don't know if that's oh, the yeah. best answer, but absolutely. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time honing these, these skills and, and learning about it from a lot of different angles and I'm still learning every day. And, um, you know, I mean, you know, every, every year I'm around, I realize, you know, how little I know. Hmm. Exactly. Oh, yeah, I feel that same way. It's, uh, you know, it, to think that, I guess to think that if, um, I don't know if I could have done things any different way. I guess I, for, at least for who I was, I needed to be kind of stubborn and like, you know, you know, hit the different walls that were there to figure out what's going on. But it's um, definitely like I, I think like you said, like you know, figuring out how things operate in like such a you know established big organization. Like, do you even if you don't fully agree with everything that's happening there, like the the things that you learn from it, you can take and then pretty much um, yeah, you can take that anywhere and try to make something new better. I mean, that's... One of the cool things about big companies is that they used to be small companies. Like, they're just small companies that did well. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And and you hope that the next thing that you build improves on that again. You know, that's... uh, Do do you find that... um, um, From the point of view of, let's say, like, like brands, I mean, of course, like it's everyone knows, everyone's more familiar with like Google or Facebook, and like they've sort of become like 
companies that acquire like other companies. Is, does that happen a lot in robotics? Is there like a kind of a battleground for like who gets acquired and like how that happens? I mean, a like, little bit. Like you look at like a company like Boston Dynamic that was acquired by Google and then sold and then got acquired by Hyundai recently. Um, I mean, our client Ari Squared got acquired by Sarcos, uh, and this is all in the news. So I'm not giving away anything, you know, privileged, but. Um, I mean, I guess like there's the McKesson Athon Omnicell acquisition where it's like, you know, a little fish getting eaten by a slightly bigger fish getting eaten by a slightly bigger fish. Um, although that one, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't fully have my head around the specs of those deals. Um, I don't know. There, there's, yeah, I mean, it happens. I would say that the robotics industry is also somewhat fledgling. Um, I mean, there's a lot more uh, to be done here. I mean, probably the most mature market segment in robotics is, is industrial robot arms that were developed for the automotive industry for welding car frames together, basically. Um, and I'm sure that there's a whole landscape of acquisitions there that I just don't know about because I've not hyper fixated on it yet because uh, it's just not a market we really sell into. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it happens. Um, do you but think it's honest. a benefit to the companies and the, in, or, you know, I guess some sort of separate questions. Is it a benefit to the companies getting acquired? Um, like, do you think they could have gone on longer developing themselves into a powerhouse instead of getting acquired by a larger, you know, company? Or was it the time for them to let go? I mean, that's pretty philosophical. And I think the answer is it, it depends, right? I mean, a company that gets acquired, I mean, nobody makes them do that. You know, it's, it's, you know, I mean, usually like, you know, they get offered enough money and the fit seems good. And I mean, it, you know, it, it, optimistic, right? It's like, you know, maybe this will be a better path. But then, I mean, there's plenty of situations where, you know, the post acquisition phase is rough. I mean, there's, you know, organ rejection, figuratively speaking, where, the acquiring firm, you know, starts to kind of break down the acquired company or the acquired company starts to rebel. I mean, it's all people and, and you're trying to merge two different cultures. I'm not like a mergers and acquisitions expert, but I mean, I've observed some interesting case studies. I mean, one of them is I just read Tony Fidel's book, Build, and in the book he talks about uh, his company Nest Thermostat getting acquired by Google and then you know, eventually he steps down and, and, you know, I don't know, it's, I'm going to butcher it, but it's interesting, um, you know, sort of the, um, some of the pain he describes post acquisition. I mean, on the other hand, you know, I, I know, you know, some companies where the acquisition enabled them, I mean, maybe, you know, the founder wants out, but then there's other people that, you know, want to do work with more funding or, you know, you have a clean integration, like after, you know, a year or two in and, you know, the company cultures kind of figure out a way to coexist. I think it depends. I mean, it's, you know, the world is, is a pretty indeterminate thing. And so I don't know that there's a one size fits all there. And I certainly don't know everything about it. And so I'm, I'm kind of learning. I, I, I've become more and more interested in how these things work in different industries. It's like, it, it all relates to me back, you know, to why, why do companies choose to partner? Why do they choose to merge in the way that they do? It's, um, it's not just for the business reasons, but also on the personal level. It's like, you know, um, for an, uh, let's say similar conversations happen, maybe on a simpler scale where artists decide to, Sign with a label versus being independent. You know, did they did they need that for the for the budget or for the network? Like, I have these conversations all the time where also um, artists feel like they've been shelved and they don't they signed with like some sort of exclusive deal with a label and they don't get the attention that they wanted. And um, it's um, surprising how often you hear that. Like, you know, a company will acquire another just because. They wanted to get the competitor out of the out of the way. Sure, yeah, I've seen that. Um, and uh, navigating that is, 
no. That's not not as much anything that I'm dealing with right now, but, you know, as artists get bigger, you know, they have to think about, like, well, are they able to continue scaling with the budget they have, or should they merge with another interest, technically interest group, you know, uh, to enhance their efforts, or is it even a good match, or does it start to now hurt their, you know, does did it did it put them into an like, unnecessary um, position where they now have to like start over? Like, um, I guess we can even talk about what's going on in Hollywood. But like, I definitely talk to artists who um, they are at the level where they're performing at festivals or like the openers at like Electric Daisy Carnival or Ultra Music Festival or whatever, and they have signed, you know, exclusive deals with like some pretty major labels in the, in the, in, in their world. And, you know, then they end up getting, they, you know, they get to the level that they, you know, dreamed of being at and they see the path forward. Okay. We can do more. We just need the cooperation. And then the label stops cooperating because they are fearful that, you know, the market share is now going to this new person, for example. Um, don't want to name any names because that it exists in a lot of different forms in different areas. But it's like that's uh, to them. It's a major blow for anyone if you're in that situation. You're no longer you did this partnership early on because it worked for you. Now now it long now it's actually like hurting your growth. You're not able to even put out music legally without like label suing you or something. Brutal. And you know. And it's, uh, you know, is it worth it to, like, is it, like, there's a lot of conversations going on, on, like, is it worth it even partnering with these companies anymore, at least in the way that they've been traditionally doing it? I mean... Should the contracts be somehow different? Like, you know, um, like, I don't operate in any exclusive way currently, so it's like, I I have total freedom to talk about whatever I want, but it's like, you know... I'll, I'll sign a song here and a sign song there, but like you know, it's at the end of the day, like I'm not gonna. Um, like I, the reason I don't sign is because like I know at the end of the day I'm driving everything, and you know that's how I prefer it, especially after my experiences with a label. Um, tr- like trying to start my own and realizing the pitfalls of having, let's say, like the what if you have the wrong investors? They might literally, if you know, if they're like choosing to back one thing and not the other thing and you know they're you're now in this relationship with them and can screw everything over like you know yeah. I, um how would i say this even better if, if, if you i don't know i'm trying to kind of go back to saying that like if you treat yourself as like the ceo and you're driving everything it's harder for others to kind of come in and like mess that up for you speaking of trying to do the best that you can to try to own whatever it is your um your brand your um, your voice, your likeness. I mean, um, live streaming has become an increasingly more important thing, like recognized by the industry, even since like the first time we spoke. Um, obviously, was sort of a niche thing, kind of like podcasting was like ten years ago, um, like pre-COVID. It was more more of a niche thing. Then all of a sudden, everyone had to adopt something like that. You know, you'd see Tomorrowland live streaming on. Oh, cool you know, YouTube or Twitch or something like that. Now it's just like a standard part of it. Um, kind of going back to the very beginning when we were talking about, well, what is then the right way to leverage yourself if you can't get yourself performing at a live venue to sell tickets and sell merchandise? What is the step before that? What's the new thing? Because, you know, those small venues used to be the place where no names would go. Now that doesn't exist. So the internet is now that new place. Um, so it's become, uh, you have streamers treating Twitch or YouTube like their, um, like people go to Netflix to see their new, the new episode of their new show. Yeah. They're always streaming on certain day and every potentially multiple times a week. And that has now become a new model to actually test and break through artist brands. Well, that's cool. Um, so yeah. I'm... I wanted to segue to that because I was I wanted to just talk briefly about 
DJ Braj Radio, who DJ Braj is my uh, production partner here, um, involved in in Polar Bowl, and we do um, we we were doing a monthly live stream. This is the background, the newest background yeah, that we great. use. And um, I just wanted to point out that we're literally in, you know, our uh, in my fiance's basement. But if you would never know when you create like an environment like this and you project it out to um, your online audience, you're able to create pretty awesome effect with very little. And like you were talking about with with your background, um, you know, this has become like the kind of the norm for like how artists are going to now like on a small scale. Yeah, gotta have a good backdrop. Show, show what we got. Um, yeah. Extension of your personality or whatever it is that you're trying to present. Like, you know, it's, um, people are, you know, it's streaming has become like, you know, again, like a TV show. People are able to come in and get that thing that they expect to get. If you're developing, it's a safe place to try anything. But if but you could become successful and really make thousands of dollars on this platform. Um, you know, for example, uh, a show that I went to, um, there's, uh, we saw Taylor Torrance, who's someone that we've collaborated with, um, in Brooklyn and opening for, for him was, um, a streamer named Miyuki who produces music, posts it on Spotify and all that, but does like almost like nightly, like DJ sets on Twitch. And she has like hundreds of viewers every day. And, you know, she cool. releases her merchandise through that platform. So, like, you know, if she's not making money from doing a show, she's making money from um, some custom merch. Like, she sells, like, awesome, like, jerseys for, like, 60 bucks, and people buy that stuff. Sweet. You know? So, like, that's... I wanted to, like, put that on your radar. That's, like, you know, become the tier. Like, and not just for artists, but from the consumer consumer's point of view. Like, you know, you don't... There's very little risk from the consumer's point of view to get involved in your brand from that view, like whether it's YouTube or something like Twitch. Um, if you like something, you can donate. That's become the new um, way to, or, or subscribe, but that's been become the new way to help kind of pay bills initially for an artist. Um, and then that, uh, you know, literally like the way that she likely got the gig in Brooklyn at this major club is that she went to them and be like, yo, you know, we have similar fan bases and I literally control it on this platform. Like they'll come and see me and do you want a partner? And that is like a literally like a stellar example of like what I think people should try to harness moving forward. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, like, the internet's great for, you know, I mean, you know, just to use a cliche, like, democratizing, you know, the distribution of art. Um, I mean, the podcast has been kind of my own personal foray into that, and, I mean, not nearly as many people watch or listen to it as I would like, but, you know, it's been gaining popularity, which is cool, and you know, put one out every week. Um, and it's it's neat to see, you know, people doing their art uh, through all these different platforms and getting recognition for it uh, through the distribution being easier than it's ever, maybe easier is the wrong word, but you know, more accessible than it's ever been. You know, you don't have to have a TV network and, you know, satellites in the air to distribute something anymore. Exactly. And I do love, like, I, I notice all the time on LinkedIn and in YouTube that you're posting the kind of shorter segments from the podcast. I love, um, there's, um, this was a while ago, but like what caught my eye was even, um, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting who it was, but it was a conversation about how to manage like large teams. That would it was like, been, it was a topic. Uh, John like John Seminatore, I think. I think so. Yeah. Yes. And, and like segments like that, even like, I think that's the way that people just consume stuff now. And obviously if they want to hear more, then they'll click on the full thing. But that's just, this has just become the norm that like you, um, I, I think the podcasts are hundred percent the way to go about it. But then like to get people funneled into the full thing, again, you have the shorter clips and, um, it's a, you might have such a, you have such a wide variety of people that it's uh, I mean, it's a matter of time that people like start, know realizing topic by topic that hey there's something like to be learned here 
Yeah, thanks. I hope so. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not making you know music uh, like you are, and I don't have the same followership I've seen. Like I, I admire kind of the amount of you know people you've been able to reach with your art, and you know just looking at your Spotify numbers and and the Billboard stuff. I mean, it's super impressive. So that's also you know kind of quite admirable, and you know just a modicum of something to look up to. Thank you. And I'm I'm never done. I feel like we're always just trying to figure out the next level. But next level is like, you know, you you don't want to build your pyramid on a, you know, on a on quicksand. You know, you want to figure out how the, the higher you want to go, the 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 more solid and wider you got to build your base. So it just takes more time. Yeah, but sure. um, but yeah, this is uh, this you know whatever I'm doing through. Polarable Productions is always. Um, I'm trying to figure out how, 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 how reasonably wide can I like make my scope in a way that it's still, you know, I'm able to affect more than just a couple private clients. I mean, obviously, if there's a couple people who want me, you know, I'm happy to do as much as I can for them. But like, ideally, I would love to figure out how I can turn that into even um, a greater platform. And I love that you you have me here to talk about these little topics yeah. i might start posting some youtube things i just don't i haven't figured out quite yet what that would be um the more people i talk to though i start to get these ideas the like things that we're talking about i talk to i talk about to all these other people as well if i do find that it's uh, makes it more effective for people to partner with us to like get a snippet of what i think through a youtube video i might start doing that um, but you know, I'm, I love that we're able to talk about this here first and uh, see what people think. Yeah, let me know if I can be helpful there. Um, definitely uh, would be curious to see what you come up with and keep me posted. Right. Absolutely. So, and uh, I just wanted to say one more thing. Yeah. I got to plug one more thing that I, we do have a the Ten Steps artist albums coming out on October sixth. But we also uh, DJ Braj and I we do that live stream. We'll be doing a live back-to-back -back set in uh, Brooklyn at this venue called Wonderville um, on the same day, um, Friday, October 6th. It's a free show um, at this, uh, basically like, um, if you've ever, ever been to a barcade, it's like that, but they make their own video, their own arcade games um, as well. So you got to come check that stuff out if you're in town. Sweet. Yeah, I really appreciate it. We'll, we'll put a link in. Um, and I appreciate it every every time. If there's anything you want to, you know, even chat about in the near future, like certain topics, I'll love to look into it and uh, figure out what we can get out of that. Thanks, Carl. I appreciate you. Thanks for coming on. Of course. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.